Can you get the laundry? Mum asked me as I sat in the living room, watching TV and eating popcorn. The buzzer had just gone off in the dryer in the basement, ringing in its harsh, dissonant way. Sighing, I got up. I had just gotten home from school a few minutes earlier. I headed across the beige carpets and white walls of our living room to the basement stairs. They followed the same decorative scheme of white walls and beige carpet, but the basement door waiting at the bottom was an old rickety thing with many cracks eaten into its surface. I went down to the basement on the same ten steps I had travelled many times before. I pushed the door open. It groaned like a terrified old man, its rusted hinges looking ready to fall apart at any moment. Behind the door lay a curtain of shadows, an impenetrable black abyss. I reached over to the light switch and tried flicking it up and down a few times, but nothing happened. Damn it, I sighed, walking into the basement. I assumed the bulb had burned out. The door closed behind me with a final groan. I pulled out my cell phone and shone it around, heading towards the dryer in the back corner. But the dryer wasn't there. The light of my phone barely seemed to penetrate the thick darkness. The shadows suffocated the light so that I could only see a couple feet in front of me. Stumbling forward with the phone held out in front of me like a holy cross, I looked for anything familiar. Beneath my feet I saw smooth concrete, just like we had in our basement. But the room seemed like it went on forever and had nothing in it. Our basement was only about twenty feet wide, and much of that was filled with the washer, dryer, water pump, and other machinery necessary for a house. I looked up, but the light only went up into a blanket of shadows, not revealing any ceiling. The ceiling, too, had risen, as if all the surfaces of the structure had pulled far away from me. Terror filled my heart. For a brief moment I had wondered if this was some sort of prank, but I knew that was no longer possible. This had to be real. I fled back towards the door, my light held out in front of me. I wanted to scream for help, but something instinctual in the back of my mind told me that was a very bad idea. As my shoes slapped the concrete, I realized I heard another sound as well, almost like chewing and dripping. Soft. Skittering footsteps accompanied it, drawing closer to me. Something cold slithered its way through my heart as I heard those sounds. I knew I was not alone down here, in this place where everything had changed. As I silently flung the door open, I glanced back. The light from the stairway formed a long rectangle that faded off far in the distance. In that light I saw something the size of a man, but resembling a burnt cadaver. It crawled across the massive concrete floor only ten feet behind me, its body thin and sunken. Its eyes were no more than dark and empty sockets in its pointed head. Wisps of thin smoke continuously rose from the black sockets. It had skin the color of burnt charcoal with jutting edges and deep grooves. Its hands and feet splayed out like massive talons. As it moved, its body cracked and snapped like burning wood. Its jerky movements to the left and right reminded me of the skittering of a centipede. Its lipless mouth continuously chewed on something. To my horror, I realized it was a dismembered human hand. The skin was roasted to a dark brown from the heat of the creature's mouth. Sizzling drops of blood rolled down its snake-like face and spattered the floor. I slammed the door behind me, looking up the stairs. I still saw the whitewashed walls and the beige carpet, but now the stairs seemed to go on forever. I looked up, seeing hundreds of stairs disappearing into the distance. I sprinted up them as fast as I could, taking them two at a time. As I ran, I heard a soft voice, so distant it almost didn't even sound real, and yet I would have recognized it anywhere. It was the voice of my mother calling down to me. Jake? The voice whispered, fading off into nothingness almost instantly. Come here, Jake. Mum! I cried, panicked. Mum! Something slammed hard against the rickety door at the bottom of the stairs. It shuddered in its frame, the cracks spider-webbing and widening across its mottled surface. 
I had run up a couple hundred steps when the door below me finally exploded in a shower of coarse splinters. Skittering forwards like a salamander, the eyeless creature with the body of charred ashes crawled after me, moving much faster than any human could. It still held the dismembered hand in its mouth, which was little more than bones with strips of gore by this point. It chewed constantly, and the wet crunching of it rose through the stairs like a whisper. I saw the ending to the stairs up ahead of me now, only fifty or sixty steps away. There was a bright red door at the end, the colour of freshly spilled blood. I could hear the creature's soft, echoing breathing close behind me, like the bellows of a forge. With every bit of energy I could muster, I pushed myself forward, sprinting towards that door, as if it were the gate to heaven itself. I pushed it open. The door slammed against the wall with a crack. On the other side, I saw a hallway with flickering fluorescent lights overhead. They made incessant pinging noises, strobing on and off in chaotic patterns. Everything was cast in a sickly yellow glow, reflecting like jaundice off the walls and carpet. I turned and slammed the door shut, pressing my body weight against it. This door looked much newer and sturdier than the one at the bottom. We hadn't had a door at the top of the stairs in my house, so I wasn't sure what to expect. To my surprise, I saw a deadbolt built into this door. I reached down and flung it into place, just as a heavy weight smashed against the other side of it. The door shuddered in its frame, but it held. More blows rained down on the other side. A frantic, insane shriek emanated from the burnt creature, fading down the endless hallway in dying reverberations. The screams had an alien, metallic ring to them. Far off in the distance, I heard echoing replies. Jake! I heard my mother's voice far down the hallway, so faint that it barely registered above the alien screaming of the burnt creature. A surge of hope rose in my heart. Perhaps there was a doorway leading back to my house, I thought. Perhaps Mum really is calling me. Mum, where are you? I yelled as loud as I could. At that moment, the shuddering of the door stopped abruptly. The sudden silence seemed deafening. I didn't trust it for a moment. Where are you? The voice whispered, as faint as rustling leaves in an autumn wind. Jake! I gave one mistrustful glance back at the blood-red door and started off down the hallway. I was exhausted and covered in sweat from my frantic trek away up the dozens of stories of steps. There was an endless beige carpet here covering the floor of the hallway that squished under my feet. It gave off a subtle, rotten smell as I walked, almost like the faint smell of stink bugs and vomit mixed together. I wondered what kind of fetid liquid had seeped into it. The walls might have once been white, but they had yellowed and peeled with age. The entire place had a run-down, abandoned feeling to it. The hallway itself appeared to have no end. As I kept walking forward, the end of it continuously disappeared into a point far off in the distance, like some sort of optical illusion. Rooms surrounded both sides of it with the same wet beige carpet and flickering lights. I saw mattresses stained with enormous pools of blood next to smashed chairs and desks. Broken computers and monitors littered the filthy floors. In a few rooms, I even saw skeletons with pieces of putrefying flesh still clinging to their pale bones. It reminded me of an office building from hell. Jake, my mother's voice came, as faint as the wind, but nearer. It seemed to be coming from a room just up the hallway. Around the area where I thought the voice might have come from, I saw an open door. Harsh, white light spilled out onto the filthy beige carpet. I sprinted toward it with a new sense of hope. Where are you, Jake? The voice came again as I turned and looked into the room. It looked like a bright spotlight was shining in my direction. It blinded me for a long moment. I blinked fast, taking a few uncertain steps inside, but I couldn't see anything past that blinding light. Mom? 
I cried, moving out of the beam that shone through the door with such radiant intensity. Inside, I found dozens of faceless naked mannequins, their plastic bodies twisted into odd positions. Some of them were posed as if they were crab-walking, while others had their heads twisted around backward. The hardwood floor looked wet and sticky, covered in a thin film of ancient clotted blood. I took a step forward, and my shoe gave a tacky sucking sound as it lifted off the disgusting floor. I looked around, confused, until I saw speakers built into the walls. They were small, metal panels with circular vents. At that moment, they started again. Jake, where are you? My mother's voice cried through the speakers. Confused, I backpedaled out of the room, sensing a trap. The glare of the spotlights blinded me as I stumbled into the hallway. I heard something faint, a rustling sound followed by a repetitive chewing. My heart dropped. I looked back, seeing three of the burnt creatures loping down the hallway toward me on all fours. They were only fifty feet behind me now that I had wasted time in the spotlight room. I swore under my breath as my heart raced and a rising anxiety and terror took over. They must have broken through the door somehow. Their smoking black sockets of eyes seemed to stare right through me. I tore my gaze away and ran down the hallway, past dozens of rooms that seemed to get stranger and stranger with everyone. I glimpsed an Olympic-sized swimming pool in one, but it looked like it was filled with blood. The smell from that room was an overwhelming one of copper and iron. The next room looked like it was taken from an elementary school, with crude drawings of stick people next to charts of the alphabet and an ancient dust-covered blackboard. Across the board, I saw someone had scrawled, Help me, I don't know where I am. I saw the skeleton of a child laying under a blanket in the corner, as if the kid had taken a nap in this evil place and never woken up. Deep bite marks were engraved into the child's neck and skull. Up ahead, the hallway finally ended. There was a wall with what looked like the beginning of an enormous slide poking out of it. The slide gleamed a cyanotic blue under the fluorescent lights, the same blue as a corpse's fingernails. Dozens of arrows surrounded it on all sides, seemingly drawn by permanent marker on the grimy walls. They all pointed insistently at the slide. The metallic shriek of the burnt creatures came from close behind me. I felt something sharp swipe at the back of my shirt. I was nearly dragged back, but the fabric ripped. I went stumbling forward. I was only a few feet from the slide. I didn't know if it would turn out to be my salvation or my damnation. Without hesitation, I jumped headfirst into it. The slide immediately went straight down. My stomach rose into my throat as butterflies filled my chest. Going down head first was far worse and more terrifying than I could have imagined, and I thought I would fall right off the slide and plunge to my death. The area around the slide looked like an eternal abyss. Where the walls of the hallway ended, I saw a sudden drop into thousands of feet of blackness. It looked like the drop just went on forever. I saw that far below me, the slide turned and curved back into the same wall I had just come from. It was bizarre seeing that bright plastic architecture suspended in the void. As I gained speed and the slide grew steeper, a scream ripped its way out of my mouth. After a steep first drop, the slide leveled off slightly. I bashed into it with a jarring, bone-rattling bounce. All the air was knocked out of my lungs. My vision went black for a long moment. I was carried away downwards on the slide at a tremendous speed, destination unknown. I don't know how long I descended, terrified and shrieking. Far below me, I saw the slide go up into a loop and then level off. I felt a rising sense of horror as I approached the loop, certain that I would simply fall out at the top and break every bone in my body. I approached the loop at a tremendous speed, feeling the cold air that smelled of the wet carpets blowing across my face as I went up it. For a terrifying moment at the top, I felt myself losing momentum, slowing down. I felt sure I would fall. 
but I was just carried over through the other side of the loop. Sweating and breathing heavily, still positioned head first on this nightmarish slide, I saw it level out ahead of me. The slide curved back around 180 degrees and entered a glowing white hatchway built into the wall. Still moving at a considerable speed, still going head first, I crashed through the hatchway. The slide suddenly ended. I shrieked as I fell through open air. I saw bright lights all around me and heard the whirring of gears. Someone was screaming nearby, but it sounded more like an excited scream than one of pain or terror. I saw a pool of water rippling underneath me, coming up fast. A moment later, I sunk through the surface like a stone. I kicked my legs, aiming myself back up. Finally, I broke through and inhaled a large gulp of sweet air. My heart was beating so fast that I thought it might explode. I couldn't believe that I was still alive. I thought I would die on that slide, and the panic still hadn't fully left me. I looked around confused. I was in front of some sort of indoor amusement park. I treaded water in a rectangular swimming pool near the front gate. The amusement park itself was contained in a massive room thousands of feet wide and thousands of feet high. The sickly beige carpet still covered every inch of the floors, even on the ramps leading up to the rides and the stairs leading up to the water slides. The fluorescent lights hung down on cables hundreds of feet long from a ceiling that loomed high above us. They flickered and strobed by the hundreds, sending ghastly shadows searching across the park. Roller coaster tracks and water slides curved and rose off in the distance. The Badlands playground was engraved in iron above the entrance and there were people on some of the rides, mostly men, all wearing black military gear and carrying automatic rifles and pistols. Roller coaster cars continuously ascended to high points, then dropped as the soldiers on them laughed and cheered. One soldier smoking a cigarette next to the front gate looked up abruptly as I dragged myself out of the pool. He had an automatic rifle slung around his shoulder, Around his waist, he had what looked like grenades and flashbangs. He pointed the rifle at me for a long moment. I paused in mid-step, frozen with fear, my clothes soaked and my shoes squishing with chlorine water. Hey, kid, what the fuck are you doing here? The soldier said as cigarette smoke oozed from his nose and mouth in a grey cloud. His eyes looked as cold and flat as frozen steel. I saw a name tag pinned on his Kevlar vest that said Sergeant Overholzer. I have no goddamned idea, I whispered hoarsely as I approached him. I think I went in the wrong basement. I don't know how that's possible, but somehow I did. I was in my house, I went downstairs, and suddenly I'm being chased by weird charcoal monsters. Why are you guys here? And where is here, anyway? We are professionals investigating an anomaly, Sergeant Overholzer said coldly. This place is that anomaly. We call it the Badlands. I looked at all those clad in full military gear, riding the many rides of the Badlands playground. Some of them had even stripped down to their boxes and were riding the brightly coloured blue, red and green water slides with whooping cheers. The slide spiralled and curved all around the park, going under coasters and over swings and merry-go-rounds. It looks like you guys are just playing on the rides, I observed. That's part of the anomaly, he said defensively. We have to ride them for, um, research purposes. What's your name, kid? Jake, I said. Jake Booth. Is there a way out of here? Sergeant Overholzer motioned with his head towards strips of red tape with arrows leading underneath the entryway to Badlands Playground. We always leave a trail heading back he said, but this place is weird. Sometimes it changes on us. Sometimes I think it has a mind of its own. As if the Badlands itself had heard his words, something like a tornado siren started shrieking overhead. The fluorescent lights all cut out simultaneously, plunging us into total darkness for a few long moments. I couldn't hear anything over the cacophony of the siren. I listened to the rise and fall of its eerie wailing. 
the excited shrieks of the passengers on the rides cut off instantly. Red emergency lights flicked on all around us, spilling their bloody light all over the amusement park and the pale faces looking down from the rides. People started screaming, but it wasn't the excited cheers I heard before. Now they were shrieks of terror. Fuck! Sergeant Overholzer cried. It's changing! Get off the rides! Get off the rides! The nearby swing carousel had a few men chained in their seats. It continuously sped up in the crimson glow until they zoomed around in a blur, their pale faces frozen into silent screams. I watched, horrified, as they raised their arms out to us, pleading for help. They started to spin so fast that they seemed to be losing consciousness, and then there was a sound like a gunshot as the metal chains holding the chairs snapped. The soldiers went flying, still locked into the chairs. They smashed into the whitewashed walls with a shattering of bones and a clanging of metal. They gave a muffled grunt as they fell. I saw with horror that their skulls had been crushed and their necks broken from the impact. I heard crashing and wails of agony from all around us. A roller coaster car flew through the air and smashed into the wall only twenty feet away from me and Sergeant Overholzer, killing the man and woman riding it instantly. They were thrown forward, and their bodies almost seemed to explode as they crashed into the wall. It looked like the water in the water slides had all transformed to thick, clotted blood that dribbled slowly down the plastic surfaces. Writhing black worms as thin and long as tapeworms swam in those rivers of blood, slithering like water snakes through the currents. As I watched, I saw them twist their long bodies around anyone unlucky enough to be on the slide, suffocating their victims as they sucked their blood with lamprey-like suckers. Shit! I knew we shouldn't have trusted the rides! Sergeant Overholzer yelled excitedly, grabbing my shoulder and roughly shoving me towards the entrance. I was against it from the start. I told those idiots I wouldn't ride those things for all the opium in China, but the engineers said they were all fine, all structurally sound, no danger, all that bullshit. But they weren't counting on this place changing to a hellscape in the blink of an eye. Damn it! As we left the Badlands playground, the screams of the dying followed us out, rapidly growing fainter and weaker, before finally fading into nothing. The bloody glow of the emergency lights continued as the Badlands playground turned into a hallway with a thin piece of red tape fixed firmly down the middle. Doors opened up on both sides of us. I saw suburban neighborhoods in some of them, but they were contained inside of massive rooms with whitewashed walls and beige carpets lining the roads and sidewalks. Everywhere we looked, the fluorescent lights were dark. Only the emergency lights stayed lit, giving off their dim, eerie radiance. Keep a sharp lookout, kid, Sergeant Overholzer whispered grimly as our feet pounded the carpet with dull thuds. Whenever the emergency lights turn on, weird shit starts crawling out of the woodwork, and this place is filled with weird shit. Even in normal times, as if on cue, something hunched, slithered out of a threshold only a few feet in front of us. Its skin was a sickly grey colour, like the skin of a corpse. Its freakishly long arms tapped the ground in time with its heavy footsteps as it skittered across the ground. At the end of its stick-like arms and legs, it had vicious curving talons. The creature was a naked, twisted thing, about five feet tall, and its entire body was covered in thousands of ears. It turned towards us, its eyeless face rising to its full height. A deep sore of a mouth opened up, revealing sharp, twisted fangs that intertwined like the roots of a tree. I felt like this creature must hear every beat of my thudding heart. All those ears seemed to twitch with every panicked breath I took. The monster lunged at us, pushing off the ground with its emaciated limbs and soaring through the air in a blur. Sergeant Overholzer raised his rifle to fire, but the beast smacked into him like a freight train. They went flying off together, their bodies spiralling through the air. 
The monster's sharp sticks of legs and arms wrapped around Sergeant Overholzer's body, embracing him like a lover. I saw the talon-like fingers and toes of the creature biting deeply into Sergeant Overholzer's legs and arms, drawing rivers of blood that flowed in thickening currents. The monster drew the fighting, sweating man closer to its fangs that grew like tumors in its slash of a mouth. Sergeant Overholzer was able to bring the rifle down and shoot the creature in the chest. It gave an ear-splitting wail that seemed to contain many harsh, gurgling voices in one. Blood, as sickly green as swamp water, oozed from the bullet hole in the creature's body, dribbling down its many ears in thick, clotted clumps. I ran over to help him. While the creature was distracted, I gained as much speed as I could and tackled it to the side. Its skin felt loose under my grasp, like the skin of a corpse, but it burned with a feverish intensity. The gurgling scream of the monster rose higher as its sharp arms came up. The black talons sliced through the air and towards my skin. I felt a deep, burning pain across my chest as it gouged a deep slash from my left shoulder down to my right leg. Blood immediately poured out of the wound, warm and wet. I backpedaled away in terror and pain as it continued thrashing its sharp limbs in all directions like an enraged hornet. Bleeding and wild-eyed, Sergeant Overholzer started to stumble to his feet. I ran over to help him up. I locked my arms around his back and tried to pull him. I felt his warm blood soak into my clothes from his many deep stab wounds. The monster lunged across the room at us. I screamed and dropped Sergeant Overholzer, falling on my back in an attempt to escape. The monster landed hard on him, its sharp fingers stabbing into his right shoulder, pinning his arm to the ground. The rifle went sliding across the hallway, far out of his reach. In desperation, he looked up at me one last time as he pulled a grenade from his pocket. Run, he whispered, his eyes flat and dead. I didn't need to be told twice. As he yanked the pin, I sprinted away from that place of horrors. I followed the red tape forward, but to where, I didn't yet know. A few heartbeats later, the hallway exploded in an inferno of soaring flames and black smoke. The red tape with the arrows continuously pointed forward as the hallway turned left and right, veering off in random directions at intersections and over bridges of beige carpet laid over a seemingly endless drop into blackness. From the rooms all around me I heard strange screaming, chewing and breathing. I pushed myself forward as fast as I could, never looking back, afraid of what I might see if I did. Finally, after about twenty minutes of this, the red tape ended at a shadowy threshold. Cautiously, I walked forward, taking out my cell phone and shining the light around. I found myself in a cave. It was eerie, looking back and seeing a random doorway built into the granite wall. There were signs that the cave had been used by some agency or another. Crates of weapons, ammo and supplies were stacked haphazardly around the entrance to the Badlands. But I saw no one here. Hello, I called out. My voice echoed eerily in the stone cavern, but no one responded. Sighing and holding my phone out in front of me for light, I staggered through the tunnels of the cave, looking for a way out. After about twenty minutes of winding passageways, I found it. Somehow, I ended up coming out in Death Valley National Park, over a hundred miles from where I had started. Exhausted and thirsty, I started trekking across the desert towards a nearby road, ready to hitchhike back home and forget this entire nightmare ever happened. I walked in the front door, my clothes ripped and blood covering my body. I had been quite a scene, and it had been difficult to get anyone to pick me up. Getting back home had taken me twelve hours, and of course, Death Valley had no cell phone service. You've been missing for two days, Mum said, her face pale and shocked. The police are looking for you. Whose blood is that all over you? Are you hurt? I just shook my head. Most of it's not mine, I said, exhausted. But where have you been? she asked. You wouldn't believe me even if I told you, I said wearily, trying to forget the horrors of the Badlands.